The trial of destruction.
was just waiting for Neil, who's gone to the first floor to see if anyone is um, uh, attending up there, and then we'll get started. I think while we're waiting for Neil to come down, I'll just say a couple of words just to thank you for, for coming to this event. Um, what I'm going to be reading is an edited version of uh, the last chapter of um, the book uh, After Crucifixion, The Promise of the Other, which is published, written by me. Um, by Cascade Books. Uh, so, um, my, my friend uh, Peter Klein has uh, done the editing work. It's just a bit longer, the chapter itself is a bit longer than what I'll be reading. So, I, I trust his editorial. Uh, Thanks, Craig. Sure. We'll formally get started now. Um, with a few people waiting for others up at the first floor. But welcome to you. Thank you for being here on this cold winter's night. Welcome to Trinity Theological College, Pilgrim Learning Community, and our Chaplaincy Education. Um, we're all coming together as one united force and um, college that will be launched um, as Trinity College Queensland. So on behalf of the Synod, I welcome you to this place and also warmly invite you back on July 20th where we will officially launch the college. I want to extend a very special welcome to all of those all over the world who are watching on our live stream. Uh, we are streaming the event live, uh, especially um, to those in Charleville, in Outback, Queensland, who are um, taking part in the National Ministers' Conference. A grateful Queensland welcome to you, Professor Craig King, and in a moment, Janice will more formally introduce you. Um, in terms of housekeeping, men's toilets are just down the door this way. Women's toilets are through the dining hall and to the left. If there was an emergency, Follow the green signs. Um, we're here tonight for a lecture, a scholarly presentation. And at moments like this, I'm reminded of the Uniting Church's deep commitment to scholarship um, as is outlined in its basis of union. And right there in the basis of union, about halfway through, there's a section called Scholarly Interpreters. It's one of our, our core document. And uh, without reading the whole thing, I thought I'd read you a few sentences to help set the scene for why we do something like this within the life of the church. The Uniting Church acknowledges that God has never left the church without faithful and scholarly interpreters of Scripture. In particular, the Uniting Church enters into the inheritance of literary, historical, and scientific inquiry which has characterized recent centuries, and gives thanks for the knowledge of God's ways with humanity, which are open to an informed faith. I love that phrase, informed faith. The Uniting Church thanks God for the continuing witness and service of evangelist, scholar, prophet, and of martyr. It prays that it may be ready when occasion demands to confess the Lord in fresh words and deeds. And so we're going to find out tonight, Greg, whether you are an evangelist, a prophet, a scholar, or maybe a martyr. <laughs> I'm not good at any of those. <laughs> you, you joked at dinner how you put, I don't want my job being an apostle. That's very so, true. <laughs> That's true. So scholarship is a vital expression of Christian mission. And that means that we don't hold these lectures and 
promote scholarship simply because that's what colleges do. Because we're a college and so we probably should put a lecture on. We emphasize scholarship because we are a church, not because we're a college. And we see this as vital to the ministry and mission of the church. So welcome to you as we um, engage in this this night of ministry. <coughs> Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but a little introduction to Professor Craig Keane for those who do not know him. Uh, Dr. Keane is an award-winning uh, professor of theology and currently the professor of systematic theology at Susan Serve Pacific University. Your bio tells me that you have held various offices in the Wesleyan Theological Society, including promotional secretary, program chair, and president, more recently. Um, Craig King has published many scholarly articles and has written two books, both published by Cascade Books. Transgression of the Integrity of God, Essays and Addresses, which came out in 2012, and After Crucifixion, The Promise of Theology, which came out in 2013, from which uh, Craig is reading from tonight. He's also under contract with Cascade Books to write Sanctity, Standing Up to the Coming of God, which will come out in the next couple of years, eventually, at some point. Yeah, yeah. To speak of Craig Keane's theology means, first and foremost, to speak of prayer, to speak of body that prayer. And to read Craig Keane's theology is to me to enter into the pattern of the liturgy, the Eucharistic community, to open oneself, as he says, to the coming of God. Central to Craig's King work, therefore, is a belief that human reflection on the mystery of God is always embodied. In his latest book, After Crucifixion, King shows that theology is structured by a pattern of embodied reflection and embodied giving. Theology here does not denote the privatised work of certain academics and certain institutions, like a college, perhaps, but rather the way in which bodies hear and believe the good news. And receive this gift as the gift that is to be re-given, given up in particular in solidarity with the bodies of the poor and the oppressed. Precisely because of this, Craig King takes these bodies up in his work. He remembers them, he speaks to them, he tells their stories. After crucifixion he welcomes us into this entanglement of words and bodies, bodies at prayer, both our bodies and the word body, the mutilated body, Christ. What is the promise of theology? The second thought after crucifixion. Maybe one way it could be surmised as the promise of God's coming, the future in which all bodies enter as one body, which is the particularized future of Jesus of Galilee. <clears throat> it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Craig you all this evening, and I'm so thrilled that he is here. I think I'm not so much an admirer of Craig's theological work as I am a recipient of his prayers. Prayers that come in ways that don't look like prayers, they are nonetheless. And so I want to introduce you with, uh, introduce him to you with my favourite quote about you, Craig. Oh, you know it's my favourite quote, yeah, I told yeah, you. Yeah. It's a comment by Stanley Halvas that appears in the introduction to the transgression of the integrity of God. Stanley Halvas writes, Craig Keane is one of the finest human beings I've ever had the privilege to count as friend. Craig, of course, is not possessed by an ambition to be a famous theologian. His ambition is to live and write in a manner that he might know better how to say what it is that makes his life and his friend's lives possible. It is this humble passion that makes his friends want to share with others what Craig has taught us. He is, after all, a theological friend. So please welcome Craig. That stand was being very nice there. Thank you very much for welcoming me and uh, Mr. My significant other for four years. Uh, what I'm about to read to you um, is entitled Teaching the Dead to Praise God. 
Um, and um, I don't write in a kind of traditional theological manner. Uh, I think uh, in my work is always sort of heavy with footnotes and that kind of thing. So I certainly do, I certainly do the research. Uh, but I, I uh, probably sweat um, the, the words, the, the phrases I use uh, as much as anything else. And so what you'll be hearing are some, some unbelievably long sentences, uh, but they will be um, at least carefully constructed ones. I mean, very deliberately constructed. And I, I, I do think that um, when people are engaged in informal conversation, the sentences often go on forever. But it's that kind of thing. You'll see. Kind of it begins with uh, lyrics from the song. I took the stars from my eyes and then I made a map. I knew that somehow I could find my way back. Then I heard your heart beating. You were in the darkness too. So I stayed in the darkness with you. When the bishop sways, shifting her weight from one sturdy or feeble leg to the other and back again, stepping right to left and left to right over a soft or hard-packed dirt floor, covered or uncovered by mats, hardwood or stone, under a flat or pitched roof or the open sky, raising her eyes from what rises from the surface of the table or the floor or her hands, raising her eyes from a scroll or codex or memory to a statistically insignificant body of children, women, and men, new or long-time friends or strangers tarrying for the night, without whom she would have nowhere at all to go and nothing to do. She teaches. She teaches bodies. She teaches them to walk and to speak. She points the way and she waits. She waits not subsequently under the tyranny of chronology, but concurrently as she points, as she works. She is no leader. It is not her task to lead. The little gathering to whom she looks, the children, women, and men, this present evil age will consign to a festering city dump once it had used them up. The children, women, men, and their already ravaged world look to her not for leadership, but for faithfulness of voice and time. It is her task with them as one body to work and to wait, that is together to follow the one she and they call their one head, the one who she says has already gone before them in the gallery. It is her task with them to step out into that coming peace that is to be done on earth, as even now, uncannily, it is done in heaven. The lesson the bishop teaches with her voice, her eyes, her hands, and her daily work, that is, is not that she knows where to find the exit, a way to some department of the interior sanctuary for endangered species, some refuge floating bodilessly at a safe distance above time and trouble. The lesson she teaches is that no matter how perfectly their one head, their incarnate God, reigns in heaven, not only over heaven but also over all creation, heaven is not our home. Heavenly ether is simply too rarefied for our wet, spongy lungs and thick blood. Its clouds too delicately fragile for our heavy, clumsy bodies. We would not joyfully linger, she teaches, were we to find ourselves there. 
Jesus is the way we are to follow, and that way may well lead through a rent veil into a safe house, she says. But if it is lived life that is to be redeemed, we will have shuffled off neither the what nor the how of a lifetime of hard work, good food, first loves, and last goodbyes. It is this earthy world that is to be set free and we with it. The bishop before the broken body and shed blood of Christ teaches this, but she is neither educator nor induction officer. The spirit leads, she tells us. The Lord and giver of life leads us out of and into this present evil age leaving us with a taste, perhaps an aftertaste, perhaps a foretaste of the coming sanctity of all that is earthy, a sanctity, she teaches us, that emboldens us to raise our faces to whomever we meet, remembering, however improbably, that this one, too, has a future in the liberation of the world. It is no mean task to teach liberation of any kind. Just saying the word provokes and confuses. It calls to mind too many storylines, too many campaigns, too many hopes and schemes, too many national mottos. It and its cognates are favored by too many competing factions. The vocabulary of liberation has been exported via expeditionary forces and trading companies from nearly every corner of Europe to the ends of the earth. From the jungles of Chiapas to the deep pockets of Wall Street, from the west and north coasts of Africa to the western Pacific. Competing voices have taken up a variety of permutations of the word since before the privilege of slave ownership began formally to shape it especially and increasingly since the modern age began to mark its territory, the term has come to signify a kind of emancipation from slavery. Modern revolutions from the late 18th century forward have taken the word as theirs. Their, symbol, their symbols are the guillotine, the gulag archipelago, the killing fields, the auction block, the lynching tree, and wounded me. Liberty, liberal, liberate, freedom are all words with abundant equivocal uses. It simply is not wise to assume when those and related words are used in theological discourse that the hearer or reader will be poised from the beginning to understand what they will have come in the end to signify. They are simply confusing words. It might seem that the wisest course would be simply to drop them altogether. And yet the language, the vocabulary, the imagery, the stories, the language of freedom is all over the traditions to which the bishop bears witness as she gestures before the assembly, the bread and the wine. On the night when he was betrayed, evokes the memory of God's election of the children of Israel, their deliverance from Egyptian bondage, God's cutting away for them on dry ground through deep water, God's defeat of Pharaoh's relentlessly pursuing army in that very sea, God's provision of manna in the wilderness and Israel's generation-long sojourn on foot after a pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night that moved always before them to the promised land. It would be a mistake to disengage the political and military energy from the language of the Eucharist. The Pharaoh is an absolute sovereign over a mighty nation. His army does his bidding by means of slaughter, of course, and the threat of slaughter. 
Pharaoh and his army stand solidly in power precisely because they are so very good at slaughter. The liberation of the Hebrew children from Egyptian bondage takes place in part as a political contest between Pharaoh, his gods in tow, and Yahweh. Yahweh fights not entirely unlike Pharaoh, but differently as well. Yahweh warns Pharaoh by vivid but vaguely delimited displays of might, the miracle of the rod, the hand, and the great plagues of blood, frogs, lice, flies, disease, hail, locusts, and darkness all enact Yahweh's power over Pharaoh and his gods. It is the final plague, however, that softens Pharaoh's resolve and weakens his grip, the massacre of the firstborn. This tale is political discourse, but not because it fosters the well-being of the polis. Indeed, this tale recounts a disastrous undoing of the polis. The Israelites, whom we are tempted to celebrate as the victors of this battle, are not victors, though they are decidedly undefeated. They depart Egypt as a wandering nation without national borders, without a city. It is not Israel but Yahweh, the God who has gratuitously elected Israel, the God who has fought for Israel when Israel could not fight for itself, who has vanquished Pharaoh, who has vanquished his army and his gods. This is political discourse because it is the tale of the unsettling of the polis, the way the unrecorded forgiveness of great debt is an economic act, even in a world saturated by capitalism. One might tease out of the narrative perhaps an oblique supplemental allusion to a polis, uncharacteristically not to be built from the backs of slaves day laborers, or nameless artisans, uncharacteristically not to rise tall out of footings embedded deeply in bedrock on reinforced concrete legs, say out of the ashes of one or another great fire or the rubble of one or another conquest. One might imagine this city to come, were it to come, as arriving, arriving certainly with hard work, but no less from beginning to end by apocalyptic adventure, that is, as a gift, as a promise that does not cease to be a promise. God moves, the faithful follow close at hand as the earth trembles, mountains quake, and rain pours down from the heavens. In this way comes their liberation. Of course, deprivation, suffering, defeat, bondage, exile, and death are in the stories of Israel wrongs that the faithful again and again decry in loud laments and petitions that rise to heaven and to the ears of God. God again and again responds mightily, even if sometimes with an exasperating slowness to carry out concretely in time and space the hard work of deliverance. And yet, God does not forever forestall the wrongs the faithful endure, not even death. Even the faithful, when they die, sometimes as they suffer in chains in a foreign land. The death of the faithful is tragic because the faithful who would praise God, who would sing praises to God all their life long, cannot praise God from the grave. Death marks the boundary of life. To cross it is to have fallen lifeless, cut off from God. That is the witness of the elect of God, God's faithful child Israel. God, the God of the living, the living God, is the polar opposite of death. 
the one in whom there is no trace of death and dying. By definition, God cannot touch death. God cannot be touched by death. By definition, therefore, to die is to fall away from God, to fail to follow God. The dead have died. God travels on in precisely the opposite direction. Everything dies. Everyone dies. Every woman, man, and child ashes to ashes. We are here for a little while, some not long enough to take a full breath. Like the passenger pigeon and the Barbary lion, families, tribes, and nations go extinct. The elect are no exception. They too are naked flesh, easy to kill. To care for them, to protect them, to tend to them, to give them time to flourish, God moves for them against Israel's enemies, those world historical powers, with those high and lifted up, those mighty kings and empires, whose armies would trample Israel underfoot as they marched to bigger and more challenging conquests. God does so not uncommonly by means familiar to those kings and empires, namely by slaughter. Of course, God also disciplines Israel, sometimes harshly, sometimes by killing a good number of its people as well, but only for the sake of the long-term good of the national body as a whole, the way a badly infected limb might be hacked off to save a life. God kills that is, to make alive, and God kills justly, even if God's justice cannot be measured mathematically, say in terms of comparative battlefield casualty figures. It is not for ephemeral human beings, dust from dust as we are, a limb hacked off, say, to stand in judgment against God. We, all of us, live only because of God's good pleasure, that is because God gives us time and breath to live. We die when the spirit God has given us is withdrawn, or so ancient Israel testifies. Consequently, when the bishop gestures before a loaf and a cup, and we all rehearse the declaration on the night when he was betrayed, we recall the overt, bloody liberation of God's elect from Egyptian and Babylonian bondage, as well as a subsequent, gruelingly long series of military and political threats to its survival. And yet something else is recalled in this moment that in no way moderates the wild, terrifying freedom of the God who broke the hearts and will of the mothers and kings of Egypt. Something, however, that takes away every reason for securing the survival of the faithful by means of slaughter. Something that takes away every threat of every enemy and opens the arms of the faithful not only to the coming of the protector God, but also to those who would snatch away every victim. That something else is also spoken by the bishop before bread and wine. This is my body that is for you. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Do not be alarmed. Jesus of Nazareth has been raised. He is not here. But go. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the liberation 
she teaches as she gestures to pour a loaf and a cup. This is the liberation that the bishop teaches as she faces the hungry faces facing her, the men, women, and children who with her would eat and drink. It is liberation in the tradition of Moses, liberation from the grip of powers that would brand the faithful with the character, valor, and social mobility that most resonate with national unity. Particularly a quote from John Milbank that he used one time online. So. It is an emancipation that will not return again to the flesh pots of Egypt. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And yet a liberation that does not have to win, that does not have to survive, is an odd liberation. Though it does not in the least undo human social, political, or economic goods, it gives to them an unsettling impropriety. I mean, brothers and sisters, the remainder of time is gathered together. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present schema of this world are passing away also. To wed, to own, to mourn, to rejoice, to buy, to deal in all seriousness with all that is entailed day in and day out over a lifetime. For example, in a marriage in which children are born, children who are then loved, cherished, guarded, and taught, but unsettlingly as if no one, not even they themselves, nor their mother and father, own a thing. How can this be? It is not only doubt that presses this question on us. The bishop, tempted to doubt, of course, as much as the rest of us, is commissioned nonetheless both to ask and to answer this question even if her answer is more provocative than satisfying, for all of us and with us, for her too, gathered as we are together. She tells us that we are to have no interest in killing and no interest in ownership, because Jesus the Galilean, driven by the Holy Spirit, is the Son of God, because Jesus, together with the Spirit who drove him into the wilderness, are the hands of God that with Jesus' crucifixion have been thrust deeply into this earth, into death and despair, into the grave, and with Jesus' resurrection have drawn the whole damned world with him into the coming reign of peace and freedom. She tells us that in this event the impossible has happened, that the very God who went before the Hebrew children through the wilderness between slavery and the land of promise has gone before us through the grave. That Jesus Christ, the slaughtered lamb, is for us the pillar of fire by night. To follow him, she tells us, is to follow the living God, where no living God could ever go, into death. Naked, exposed, wounded, contacted, infected, seized, ravaged, and devastated by death. And there, with, after, and in this Son of God whom death could not hold, impossibly to praise God, the God of the living. This is no cult of dying and rising gods, no being toward death, no platonic practice for dying and death. Each of the faithful, those who follow Jesus, is a body 
a body not to be enthralled by a pious image, not to be totalized in the anticipation of its own demise, certainly never to be sloughed off by a then emancipated soul, but a body whose life is a death sentence that ends with a hard period, a death sentence written into the death sentence that is the earthy history of Jesus, whose defeat is swallowed up in victory and with it the defeat of all God's children too. The baptized, fed together on the loaf and cup, attending to one another, thinking, working, confessing, recurrently repenting, in everything praying without ceasing, learn both all at once and bit by bit to remember day in and day out that their lives are written into the life of Jesus. To hope rather than fear, to pray not only for those to whom they are most naturally attached, but also for their persecutors, with whom also in Christ they live in hopeful solidarity. The baptized learn to celebrate and mourn and live in peace with their neighbors and strangers, to live humbly with the humble, to acknowledge openly their own foolishness and ignorance and to forego the balance, justice, and vengeance that so decimate this world. Jesus, in whom the whole fullness of deity is pleased to dwell, was from beginning to end a very earthy man. It is this earthiness that has resisted every docetous and idealist effort to turn him into a ghost. The pain of his journey from the pain of Gethsemane to the pain of Golgotha is not a substitute pain. It is his pain because it is his journey. Nobody heaps anything onto Jesus. He does not carry on his shoulders somebody else's weight, the weight, say, of an alien world. On Golgotha, he descends. He moves into that already densely tenanted abyss. He is forsaken. He dies. He is damned. He is unqualifiably at home with those who are unqualifiably at home in hell. That is not as a placeholder, but truly bona fide, bona fide. He has, he has been traveling here his whole life. This is why the Gospel of Mark begins with his baptism in Judea, that is in the shadow of the Jerusalem where he was to be slaughtered. Each time he touches the people he meets and they touch him, the abyss cracks open a little more. Sometimes witnesses to these rupted moments witness ephemeral healings as well. Perhaps notice healings alone, but as they touch, his body in every case mingles with theirs, more often than not with their defiled bodies. So much so that temple legates on assignment in Galilee and eventually their Jerusalem superior is seated in power, find in every detail of the course of his life nothing but scandal. They are not wrong about him. He does not merely pretend to be one of the defiled. He and they are not members of different classes. And with all the defiled, the temple authorities would have him cast out of the temple precincts out of holy Jerusalem, out of God's promise, out of hope. To Rome, he is a pathetic dissident, a would-be insurrectionist, a delusional peasant king, who in his dreams and the dreams of his chroniclers would run its legions into the sea. He would upset, they believe, the order of efficiency, property, law, productivity, and extrapolable outcome. 
he fails to operate according to the divine logic, the logic of nature, of Rome, of the emperor, of his envoys, the logic that proves itself by the endless propagation of Roman coinage. He is, in short, a bothersome fool who drains away attention from the pressing demands of greatness. They are not wrong about him any more than the leaders of the temple and Rome knew how to deal with local provoc provocateurs. It knew how to swat pests that buzzed annoyingly about its ears. It responded swiftly, justly, demonstratively, and decisively, with violence, of course. But not too much, just the right number of days of prolonged, humiliating public agony to leave an indelibly deterrent imprint in the memories of its contributing subjects. Jesus, and this too must have been a minor irritant, would die too quickly for Rome's purposes. Still, he would die. He would die the death of an insurgent brigand. He would serve that educational purpose. The little peasant, a scandal according to Jerusalem security surveillance logarithms, and madness according to Rome's, speaks with a voice that is silenced when the time is right by the back of Jerusalem's hand and the hammer blow of Rome's fist and the distracted, deafening, idle clamor of the crowds of Judeans who had had enough of him in his inflammatory speech. Cities, Jesus would have them believe, would soon lie in waste without inhabitant, the houses without people, and the land utterly desolate, and vast the emptiness in the midst of the land. And if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebin or an oak whose stump remains standing and it is felled. Not one stone of these great buildings of the temple will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. There will be earthquakes. There will be famines. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And to their narrowed eyes and their do you not know what we are capable of? Cross-examination. He replies, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The horror he agonizes through in Gethsemane and then on Golgotha does not seem to be that meted out habitually by Jerusalem or Rome. He faces the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes, and he faces Pilate. To his I am, the Judeans howl their shock and dismay. To his you say so, the Roman is simply struck dumb. Both condemn him, the former with great knowing satisfaction, the latter with confusion as if the whole affair made no sense to him at all. Jesus yields without struggle. There is in him none of the just insolence of Socrates, and that there is in Jesus' countenance here no distress, nothing of the agony of the garden or the hill. In fact, what is most striking is the calm, the silence of Jesus before these ruthlessly powerful men. Socrates has elegant poise in his courtroom irony. Even as he wrestles with his opponents, he stands tall and aloof benefactor, both brusquely and alluringly a sagacious educator to the end. Jesus sees nothing to combat, nothing to defend, no noble apology to be made. And yet he does agonize in the garden, even more so on the hill, dying, in fact, in agony. It is hard for us to take in a Savior who dies in agony, 
unless, of course, we imagine it all is merely second-hand suffering, that is, as a charade. Further, there is nothing in a good first reading of the Gospel that would lead us to imagine prior to Gethsemane that he would die so poorly. Even in the aftermath of the Caesarea Philippi pronouncement, this son of man who is to suffer and die does not seem like the kind of man who would openly bay in pain, no matter what kind of pain, no matter the kind of pain. In immediate retrospect, in the light of the great heroes of the Maccabean and Hellenic pasts, his death does not measure up to the standards of nobility. Perhaps especially in later retrospect, in the light of the deaths of the martyrs of Perpetua and Felicitas, say, he fares no better. Though Perpetua and Felicitas are not buoyed by the apatheia of the Stoics, the apatheia of the Stoics admired in Socrates, and it is clear that dying comes hard for them, they do not shout at heaven, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They do not give a loud cry as they die. The centurion who faces Jesus at the foot of the cross may seem to size up the character of his death approvingly, but he speaks with the same satanic voice that failed to work its con in the synagogue in the Gospel's first chapter. His words may in some abstract sense be true, for example, may accord with the title verse of the book, but they are no truer to Jesus' work than are Peter's obstructive outburst at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus' death cry, his pathetic expiration, his giving up the ghost, the evacuation of the spirit that descended into him with his baptism, is in itself the kind of detail well-adjusted parents would do well to skip during story time at the bedsides of their well-adjusted children. There is nothing about Jesus' death as an isolated phenomenon, as a thing in itself, that does anyone any good. He dies and he is dead. His heart and lungs and brain stop and he is no more the dead weight of dead tissue yearningly opens his throat to praise God. He no more yearningly opens his throat to praise God. But this thing, this corpse, this quantum of hardening muscles and blood and skin and bones is no device for leveraging a happy outcome no assayer's bag of weights, no money order. He dies as the thieves hanged with him die, as die peasants and castaways all over Galilee, the Decapolis, and as far as nightmares reach, namely at the hands or under the calculative gaze of Rome and Jerusalem. He is simply and directly one of them, his life, too, has been poured out like water, and it has drained into the dry ground of Israel's bleak wilderness, mingling with theirs. His death mingles with theirs. They are his neighbors in death, and he takes them in and is taken in by them. They are he, and he is they, even as the are and is the they and he. Black. And yet, in the telling, the death of Jesus, like all deaths of closure, is not a closure alone. The Spirit enters into him accompanied by the Father's voice in Mark's baptismal overture, and exits from him accompanied by the Father's silence in Mark's baptismal finale. There is nothing in this text that compels the reader to believe that the Father, who declared his love for the Son from high above the housetops in the first chapter, has come in the passage to which the first most directly alludes to disdain him. Even with the Son's cry of dereliction, one need not take the silence of the Father of the beloved Son as a signal of disinheritance. 
In the gospel, Jesus' work is marked not only or chiefly by declaration, but also and above all by silence. A silence again and again commanded of those with gratitude or malice, who with gratitude or malice would seize him with a turn. For it is not only with Jesus' baptism, but also with his crucifixion, that the holiest of veils, the curtain whose long, heavy, wide, tall, and deep fabric would preserve the seclusive integrity of heaven and earth, is ruptured, torn apart, with apocalyptic ferocity. The closure of Jesus' death is thus not erased, but outbid by an ineffable revelatory nevertheless. There is, however, no denying Jesus' outcry from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, Leme Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The forsakenness of the Son is the forsakenness of all who die, especially those who die with the it is finished of a lifetime without integrity, authenticity, or identity that is among the outcasts of Israel, among bloody, slimy, oozing, filthy, creepy, naked, limbless, abject, noxious vermin, an illegal alien, say, or a queer, or a bandit, or perhaps a fatherless, childless, futureless, contemptibly lewd woman, or any crowd of women, men, and children already as good as dead. Everyone dies, some particularly unhappily. The words of dereliction shouted from the cross voice the horror of the damned with whom Jesus had been rightly counted his whole adult life. They are not his words alone, just as his life is not his life alone, just as his death is not his death alone. The death of Jesus does its work certainly because of the way it is set apart from other deaths. The proclamation that it is precisely the Son of God who dies between bandits on Golgotha is not based on the extrapolative logic of more or better, the outward expression of a kind of rigorously internal comparative judgment, any more than it is an empirically grounded hypothesis someday to be verified by data collection and analysis. But that's not the best. <laughs> it is a night different from other nights. It is a there you can't get to from here. But the death of the Son of God is set apart from other deaths, in particular because of the way it is inseparable from them. That is, it is not in the strict sense of the term sui generis. This one person in two natures, homoousion to patri and homoousion to men, is Emmanuel, God so entangled in us in our bodies, in our histories, and the damage that we have done and the damage that has been done to us, that the only path to him is the one beneath the transient shadow cast in mid-course by an unfinished step. The path, that, the path that he is on, the path he is, does not transport those who walk it to some alien geographical or metaphysical space, some outland, there is no ascension narrative in Mark, even if, as in Luke Acts, the story here had ended with a slipping off into the clouds, the heaven that would welcome him would be an earthy one, the full sweep of the world before God's watchful care, perhaps, that is a panorama. On earth as it is in heaven, Matthew says, in life, and in death, he is us, is with us. The difference that occurs where he lives and dies is in hypostatic. Very obscure theological term, so if you want to see something, go ahead. He is a human being who abandons all the what, all the physis, the natura that marks him as a human. He abandons all that to the coming of God. 
And though a theology without a story to tell may insist otherwise, he is a human being who abandons all the that, all the hypostasis, the persona that marks him as this human, he abandons that to become the God's God. When God comes, God comes where he lives and dies without robbing him of anything human. Even his self-effacement is not forced on him. He offers it with gratitude. He lives the life we live and dies the death we die without qualification. He does so as an open throat, as open flesh, open eyes, open speech, open arms, open lips, lips through which his last breath is released to the coming of God. He is Emmanuel, especially here. When he expires, when he gives up the ghost, his life is finished. And it is finished as our lives are finished when we breathe our last. And if his death is in toto and unarticulated prayer, come Holy Spirit. His mutilated body repeats this prayer long after it is taken down from the cross. It repeats it here with us, bathed and fed as we are. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, follow me. To follow him thus is with him, after him, here and now, to open like mutilated flesh, like yearning eyes, like reticent speech, like suppliant arms, like with hot innocence to be kissed and kiss, that is, in prayer, in hope, undone, marveling toward a promise of a wind that would so trouble dark waters, the dark Jordan, the dark seas, that they would, in spite of themselves, give up every ship and sailor they had grabbed. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could reach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my beloved Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, Peter and James and John looked around. They saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. This is what the bishop teaches as she gestures before the loaf and cup. She teaches it and with the gathered body learns it. She learns it as they learn it in the never to be presumed fresh literate or illiterate reading of God breathed texts. That is again and again in and out of the room face to face with faces upturned in the room or not and never in the room. She declares as if they were her words, but with deference as anything but her words, the follow me. As her trailing breath and God's inaudibly proclaim the ellipsis that the follow me opens into, her memory and hope stir. She silently confesses with Augustine both her sins and the sovereign forgiveness of God, a forgiveness that hallows, that comes as an insuperable eschatological peace, as a future impinging upon the present and the insistent past to which it is chained. God forgives. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. But the gift that ruptures the present that goes forth into was and is from what is yet to be is no less a call and a task. Forgiveness creates, as Isaiah, Genesis, and Paul understood. 
and they and those who have heard them well have also understood that to be created is to be set out on a journey. We, the forgiven, are little children, newborns, newly created, created in Christ Jesus. The incarnate Christ Jesus is the universe in which still wet with amniotic fluid, our lungs and eyes have uncannily opened. But the incarnate Christ Jesus is no dead space, no lost time. He worked and works as all flesh works. He is a whole universe in which to live is to be created for good works. For the works that mark the story of the Jesus who called the crowd of his disciples to journey after him. Follow me. The anguish of Jesus in Gethsemane and on Golgotha is the anguish of Emmanuel, that is, our anguish. It is his anguish too, of course, his anguish due not to the threatening might of the high priest or Pilate, but to the horror of death vis-a-vis -vis God, the living God. Jesus, who travels out into the coming of God his whole life long, is with us thrust into the abyss where by, defini de where by definition God cannot go. He is thrust not into an idea but into a grave. He who is nothing but an open doxological throat, a throat that proclaims to its last breath the coming of the reign of justice and peace and life, falls across the boundary that separates his beloved Father, the God of the living, from the starless darkness of the night without the prospect of the dawn. He who would without end joyfully lift up his face to praise God has been thrown down where no throats gape, where flesh hardens and softens, melts and dries to dust. God travels on where the dead simply may not and cannot travel. This is the anguish of death. The faith will tell us the anguish of death for all, that is, this is the anguish of Emmanuel. Jesus has not ceased to give himself to the coming of God's reign when he gives up his last breath in wordless, barren doxology outside the gates of Jerusalem. His prayer cannot but be wordless. One crucified does not know how to pray as she ought. How could she? How could he? There are no logoi, no words that might yield doxology from the cross. How could there be? Even one hale and hearty with both feet planted firmly on the ground prays doxologically uncannily. One crucified, giving up the ghost, lacks even the paltry strength of the unafflicted. In order for a doxology to be uttered at the moment when Jesus' last breath is let go from the cross, the very doxa, the very glory of the Father to whom the beloved Son has now given everything, given unqualifiedly all that he is, would have to travel not away from, but to this fast dying man. Would have to be pleased to dwell here when and where he dies. The darkness of this day would have to be pierced as if the mutilated body of the crucified had grown dazzlingly white. Born by the impossibility of miracle, this doxology would exceed every doxology. The way sometimes a groan or a sigh evoked, not expressed, outstrips articulate speech. The very dying body of the crucified would then wordlessly voice the doxa, the glory of the Father. Word would become flesh. Flesh would become word the word we could never speak, the word that could only be spoken to 
and welcomed by us as every possible barrier to it is transgressed. When this word is spoken, it is spoken to us because it is spoken to him. It is welcomed by us because it is welcomed by him. Him whose every line of defense is on the cross reached, reached because relinquished. He and this word concur because he has relinquished every line of defense that might have presumed to hold it at bay. He and we concur because he has relinquished every line of defense that might have presumed to hold us at bay. His passion, however, is not simply passive. He is not only acted upon in his suffering. The agony of the cross is a concurrence of the work of the word spoken and the work of the Galilean, namely the diophelite work of rupture, the inhypostatic, the anhypostatic work of nevertheless. The agony of this concurrence is the agony of Emmanuel. It occurs here and now, not as a presence that might serenely be, but as a coming, a coming that would open a way, a task, a future. Jesus come is the come that Matthew tells us is easy, light, and it is here in the darkness. The roominess of the New Jerusalem opens here where this present evil age does its worst. There is no outside the walls of the New Jerusalem. Even if there were, the gates are open and any and every outsider may come in. There is no condition for a roomy place in the New Jerusalem. Even the lame, even the dead, even the damned are set free here and run with abandon. But woe to those who would incarcerate the Holy Spirit, who would throw up new lines of defense, conditions that would exclude, include, conclude, occlude the freedom for which Christ has set us free, who would yet claim the property right to judge who is in and who is out. The bishop teaches as she gestures before the remarkable and unremarkable people who come and go where she is given to do her work. Before those standing on their own two feet in the prime of life, before infants held, covered, and warmed in their parents' arms, before a font, before the old or too young adrift on their deathbeds, moving among them in and out of time and space, the betrothed, the contrite, the apostate, the ordinan, the adult, the grieving, the gleeful, the ambitious, the bypass, the prodigy. It is the bishop before the cup and the loaf, which is more like the one who fares as gratuitous ruptured flesh, are nothing without these people he and the bishop loved these people without whom he and the bishop would have nowhere at all to go and nothing to do. These people in whose lives the Father of the Son and the Spirit is through the Son and in the Spirit freely forever in pain. God, never needy or vulnerable, never alone or lonely, is love and thus Emmanuel. Therefore the bishop teaches and she prays the epiclesis because her voice, her eyes, her hands, and her daily work will not do. They are only gestures. They do not and cannot hold, and they do not and cannot distribute what the people she so loves desperately are without. Her gestures may only entreat, implore, give thanks, and await. It is the spirit who saturated the mutilated body of Jesus, who comes to carry to their eschatological end the fleshy prayers of the bishop. If the healings of Jesus are acts by which the broken people of oppressed Galilee 
are restored to can, there is another more revolutionary act in his work, an act that carries its own potency, that is an act that is free to interrupt the intractable protology of can. The phrase used for this eschatolog eschatological work, for example, in the Gospel of Mark, is much too familiar for us to be struck by it. It is hard for us to hear it as anything but proprietary magnanimity as a kind of investment firm's savvy customer care representatives, no problem. It is nearly impossible for us to hear it as an upending of all that is proper and authentic, all that is good, true, and beautiful. Nonetheless, it is, as the horrified scribes in Jesus' house immediately understood. Son, your sins are forgiven. The forgiveness of sins is the interruption of cannot by may and then by does. When cannot fails to provide a barrier to may and does, everything unravels. The sun is darkened, the stars fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens are shaken. And yet it is precisely here in this sun your sins are forgiven, this little girl get up, that the whole of creation is unmade and made anew that the Galilean peasant carpenter's son comes with great power and glory to reign when on the cross he is lifted up from the earth and draws all people to himself. To teach this calls for the bishop's whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, but it also calls for her neighbor, for without her neighbor she has nowhere at all to go and nothing to do. That's it. What are you doing? We've just got some time for some questions, so I know you just take a few more. Some breath. And, um, yeah, please feel free to go ahead and I'm sure you can just break it here. Yeah, any kind of question. Maybe we don't, you know, understand what it's like to do so strange like that. Sounds like poetry. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's theology through poetry. Did you make a decision at some point? in your life to write in that particular way. Is there some epiphany that occurred? Yeah. Um, I did, I did some. I'm not sure if I decided in a moment to do it. Um, I mean, a, a couple of factors are involved here. Um, the, the first two theologians I ever studied closely, uh, two persons that are often considered not to be theologians at all, uh, John Wesley and Sword Kierkegaard. And uh, Kierkegaard, of course, writes in a very poetic way. He calls himself a kind of poet. And, and Wesley's theology is done largely in sermons and letters. Um, and so, I mean, Wesley has a very logical mind and all that, but I mean, metaphors are everywhere. So I think both of them made a deep impact on me. And uh, plus, um, you know, I fell in love with and married an English major um, who loves writers and is herself, is herself a writer. Uh, an unpublished writer, which is not fair. It's not fair. Uh, but there are other things. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I, I love uh, popular music. Yeah. I spent many hours listening to some pretty decent music, I mean, for my own, by my own standards. And also, there's, this, there's a thing that happened um, when I reflected, when I thought seriously about the fact that we are embodied, that we are bodies. I, I started then to think about what mode of discourse would fit with that. I mean, if, if, we, if we 
worship a savior who is raised bodily from the dead, then then language needs to be incarnate, you know, it needs to be fleshy. And so that means that language needs not just to be a matter of sort of the highest possible concepts, the ones that are almost out of your brain, you know. Uh, but uh, and let me go this way. Um, we, when we think of, when we imagine someone thinking, we imagine the courage right here, you know, as, as close to out of the body as possible. The ancient Hebrews believed that we think right in the middle of the chest. You know, the heart is where you think, and that's not, you know, you shouldn't bring to that sort of romantic notion. It means that you think in your chest. So I, I started to imagine what, you know, what would it be to, to write that way. And I see that something like poetic discourse um, and um, it's also my um, neither of my parents like uh, went to college. Neither one of them graduated from high school. My father, in particular, uh, was very uneducated. Died a little less than a year ago, '94. Um, but when my father spoke, he didn't speak often. Uh, he almost always spoke in very vivid metaphors. You know, I just say this. You know, Oklahoma, we talk about he's from Eastern Oklahoma. And he just would sit and he'd say, well, as am I? You know? In Southern California, the sun feels like it's sitting around the top of your head. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if you could understand the accent. But, <laughs> but I mean, he spoke very vividly. Um, and he would, I mean, if you told him he was a poet, he might pitch you. you know? So he never, he never thought that at all. Uh, so I think that, in my mind, is, is just sort of delightful. Funny and just metaphors concept. So it, it occurred to me that it, it's really a, a certain kind of, uh, I think something bad happens to us when we are educated. Uh, I think we suddenly think that it's all about propositions and syllogisms, uh, sort of laying out everything with sort of clear parameters. And, you know, we have to be able to sort of seize ideas and hold them. And, and manage them. Um, but, you know, folks who haven't been abused by reading <laughs> that matter um, have something to teach us, I think, about. So, I mean, I, to say it differently, I once heard someone say, um, you know, the more I speak publicly, uh, the less poetry I use and the more prose I use. Those aren't necessary. They keep us conversing. Because that's the way people talk. People talk in prose. I thought, you're an idiot. <laughs> you ever listen to anyone talk? Do you ever listen to anyone talk? Uh, people speak in poetry when they're not trying to impress. That's at least I believe it. So I made the decision. When I, when I write, I want this to be heard with the body. I want this to be heard while you're alive or you're working, or you're hungry, or you're tending to your kids, or you're scared of something, or you're delighted from something, that everything's, and, and one, one more thing, just way too long a response to it, it's a nice, simple question. Uh, uh, this, this may be due to the fact that um, I was raised, not by my parents, but I was raised within a Wesleyan holiness context. And so the notion of entire sanctification is a huge deal. I give utterly all of your, you know, utter devotion. Uh, I also thought about that. I thought, okay, if I'm going to give everything to God, also theologian, it's got to be everything. If I, if I have this sort of word work to do, it can't be detached from you know, like my body. So I, my task as a writer and thinker is to do it all as far as that I have. Including what I can't say. I mean, the most important thing about what I say is what I don't, you know. <laughs> I think is what I did not say. So yeah, that's that's I, I decided for those reasons about this. That's a very devotional. Thing. Ah, yeah. Yeah. I'm very glad. Could I say uh, my instant response is this is probably not the book I would read to prepare for uh, an assignment at university. <laughs> that's right. But it's the book I would take with me on the trip. Oh, that's wonderful. Is that a, that, that's, that's the most heartfelt, positive response I can make. That's, that's wonderful. You know, it becomes a part of one's 
um, spiritual journey. Yeah. Because the, the, I would hope it would also be a challenge to a professor to rethink what exams are for. Um, and, I, and I, I mean, I sort of teach this way too, and evaluate it this way. The weirdest thing is putting a number on it. Uh, that also is good. And it, it's asking a lot of students to say, I want. I want you to know all the stuff. I want you to just know it all. But I want you to say it like you're going to live it out. That's a lot to ask of anyone. But I found students uh, rise to the challenge. And it becomes, all of a sudden, the course now is, is not just credits. All of a sudden, this course is, it enters into, and they enter into it too, and into me. You know, so Becomes something we do together as we're stumbling along, trying to pray. I thought it was the same thing to you. I was trying to feel like I've had a, a slow walk through a art gallery or something. Ah, that's, that's very good. That sort of. I'm very interested in. in Oasis as a, as a way yeah. of knowing, and I think that, that from the people that I kept wanting to turn around to Nathan and say, Don't you want to be a minister? Now? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want to be a minister? Now? <laughs> 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 Don't you want to be a minister? Now? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The yeah. title so, was Teaching the Dead. Teaching the Dead to Praise God. That word teaching, if I heard correctly, they used. You use the word she teaches, the bishop. No, she teaches, she teaches. But at the beginning, I thought I heard you say she's not a teacher. No, she's not an educator. Why is that? Uh, she's not a leader. The word educate means to lead out. Lead out. She's not an educator or an induction officer. Like, you know, to feed in. Um, it's the Holy Spirit who leads. So the words of the bishop are means of grace, uh, if the spirit so flows. Uh, but it is not her job to lead. It's her job to gesture. And that, that's that's something I, I mean it took me a long time to come to that position. I you know, as a as a university professor, no longer to believe in education is sort of is you know sort of questionable. Uh, and I, I and I don't I don't believe in education, but I do believe in teaching at home. I believe in teaching at home. Okay, what's happening when someone gets up and preaches them? What do you see teaching? Yeah. Well, um, if if we don't, if we let the word teach, uh, we sort of unhook it from our kind of ordinary usage. Maybe not every way. I think we do use it in rich ways. But you know, if we think of like an educational institution or something, we're teaching or something like that, we tend, I think, to think something pretty near that. Um, but I'm suddenly thinking of Crosby Stills and Nash song, you know, Teach Your Children Well, I think. Uh, but I think that's a, a richer understanding of teaching. But to teach is to tell, to preach is to proclaim. It's not that different. Um, we may lean slightly different directions, but the preacher teaches, the teacher preaches. Um, but you have to be careful with that because, you know, there's a certain kind of teaching you don't want anyone to do, actually. Certainly not a preacher. There's a certain kind of preaching you don't want anyone to do, certainly not a teacher. Uh, but it's, I mean, my job as a professor is. To profess, uh, to tell, to speak, and hope that there will be listeners who speak and hope that I listen. I just actually just did a paper I did for the symposium we had. 
Doug Desimor, with uh, Basil Cesare, uh, who in his, his book, On the Holy Spirit, uh, distinguishes between proclamation and dogma, paradigma and dogma. And the only difference between those is that preaching is public and dogma is not. Dogma is secret, he says. Uh, and I think this has got all kinds of things going on. Interesting. And, and largely it's secret because it's about the way you live. How did you ever just sort of say the way you live? You live the way you live. So it's a similar view. Yeah. I think one of the questions that people have been able to do is uh, systematic theology that I that I love uh, love to ask, but never get a chance to ask. Okay. Is it Ask away. Idea, you know, that uh, we could fix it and say? Yes. I hope we know how consciously the Christ got that divinity. But at the same time, we you know what the talk is. But I just wonder, does he know all the pain, emotional pain? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think sort of kind of the way I was sort of uh, kind of trained to approach scripture, let, let's say like the Gospel of Mark. The way I was kind of trained to approach the Gospel of Mark was to think of it as a kind of biography and to, to imagine what's going on in Jesus psychologically or in terms of his knowledge. And, and, and there was some history of, of, of research into, into the Gospel, Gospel Mark and Peter that talk about sort of Jesus growing messianic consciousness or something. But it's focused on his inner life. I don't think the gospel writer is certainly not Mark. I don't think Mark has any interest in Jesus' psychology or consciousness. So in terms of what Jesus knew about what was coming, um, what he sort of could feel by anticipation, I don't think that enters into the story. I think not at all. It may be too strong, but I think not at all. Now, in in Gethsemane, when he's praying, he certainly is pictured as seeing what's coming, well, or knowing what's coming, conscious of what's coming. So, um, but I think, I mean, as as profoundly moving as that scene of Gethsemane is. I think the point is much less about how he's dealing with this awareness, and much more the question is, is he going to do it? So it's, it's the question of, okay, uh, Paul in the Kenosis passage in Philippians 2 has his own interpretation of what's going on, for example, in Gethsemane. You know, have his mind among you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, not the quality of God, something to be grasped, and he was out the other that passage. Um, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that, that that passage is Paul's contrasting Jesus' let's say response in Gethsemane. I mean, Paul doesn't talk about Gethsemane, but just say Gethsemane. Paul's um, understanding of what happens in Gethsemane compared to what happens in the Garden of Eden. Two different gardens. Um, in the Garden of Eden, there is Adam, who was in the form of God, you know, who was created in the image of God, who regarded equality with God. If you eat this fruit, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Uh, who considered equality with God as something to be grasped, the way you would grasp fruit from a tree. So instead of that, Jesus in the garden um, was in the image of God, did not regard equality with God as something to grasp, but rather emptied himself. And what it meant in Gethsemane is that he gave up the knowledge of good and evil. 
Because if he had acted according to the knowledge of good and evil, he could never have gone to the cross. Because there's nothing about that that would say this is good. But why does he go to the cross? Because the Father sends him there. And so he empties himself. He found a human form, maybe one or two months. Taking on the form of a serpent. So yeah. obedient to God at the point of death, even death in the cross. It's, it's the, the contrast with, with Adam and, and, and Eden is just, I think, so in other words, um, the consciousness of Jesus, the sort of psychological dynamics of Jesus, I think don't matter. Except at certain points, at certain points, he, his knowledge of what is coming becomes significant. For example, at Caesarea Philippi, or in the Garden of the Sunday, you know, I'm going to suffer. Um, but he's just, he just headed there, and it says we tell about passage, the, uh, the confession of Peter, passage. and he's on the cusp of it. I mean, that's that's not the answer you were hoping I would give. So, I mean, I, 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 what I sort of say is, I don't think that question could be answered. I suppose what I heard from you is that not involved, that could be silent. So therefore, uh, it's just, it was that uh, imagination. Yeah, yeah, I think it's right. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think it's, I think, I mean, our tendency, I think, is to psychologize everything. So, like, the story's not interesting unless we can sort of get inside somebody's head. I don't think you can get in Jesus' head. I don't think, you, I don't think the gospel writers are interested in that question. So they don't give us any clues to the answer. Yeah, sure. Okay. I don't think it's a very good response, but at least it's a long one. <laughs> but thank, I, I did my best. I will say something. Yeah. It was wonderful to hear you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm not with it. I will now. Oh, good. But, but I'm really glad that my introduction to it was hearing you. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Speak it because. There's, there's something about the way that you can yeah. with the, the power, the emotional power, the poetic power of it, um, and, and the message itself. <laughs> that comes when you, you, you shut your eyes yeah. and just hear it. Exactly. And in the hearing is the seeing. And in the seeing comes the insight and understanding. I actually think it's about formation. Or or maybe Genesis. deeper, maybe. It's got to be on Genesis, must be. <laughs> it, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. He's already heard the beginning of that chapter several times. <laughs> 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 our, our daughter, Heather, is, is now uh, 42, right? She's turned 42. Uh, we had her when we were like three. I think we were three. <laughs> uh, Dr. Heather, um, I read to Heather regularly when she was small. And she said, uh, and actually I, I taught her at college at almost every day of the week for the first three years that she was in college. She said, when I read, I hear your voice. I don't just read anything. She reads, reads anything. And I, I, I do write, um, write this sort of voice. Hey, could I ask uh, about the editing? Yeah, sure. To what extent uh, do you go back over after? I guess I I hear the, the teaching preaching as um, as being a vessel through which God's grace and, and God's wisdom flows. So, to what extent do you do um, an editing um, yeah. the process? Uh, it took me many years, maybe a decade, probably. Um, and um, I do sort of edit these things to death, but I don't edit them. Edit them. This, uh, let me put this way. I just I read them over and over and over and over, changing words, uh, changing rhythms, uh, 
Actually, I sometimes actually shorten sequences. <laughs> but I find that as frequently I lengthen them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do a great deal. Uh, I was surprised when I sent this into Cascade. Your editors do. Uh, but I mean, I expected to get just you know, massive changes, but almost nothing. Hardly any changes. And very unconventional punctuation marks that convince me should not be used. <laughs> <laughs> but some they let in. I use ellipsis marks. The silence. Right, you're going to kiss me, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Navy <Nathan> Lucky. <laughs> Craig, my name's John. Uh, I'm uh, General Secretary of the Church here and uh, been asked to just offer a word of thanks. To uh, echo where Aaron started, uh, the theological uh, exercise is core to who we are at mission, giving voice to who God is in and who, who we are. And uh, you have uh, enriched us, gifted us tonight, uh, challenged us to embody who we are, who God calls us to be. And to find words uh, that don't necessarily need full stops. <laughs> Allow the, uh, the journey of the story of God to flow in through our mind. So, uh, from us to you, thank you. We appreciate your time uh, and sharing your gift with us. It's been a rich experience. And uh, I'm off that. Well, <laughs> no, it's good. He's it's, it's, it's it's good. good. Thanks, I'm great. That's good. That's good. We heard you here first. Let's pray. God of grace. For the richness of your presence with us. In the moments of silence. In the roar of the everyday. And in all that sits in between. We give you thanks. For the time that we spent, for the challenge and the opportunity which we have received, we give you thanks. We pray your blessing and pray as he continues to serve you and offer this gift into the life of your church. And we pray that together we might be a community of life and love and faith. Bearing witness to your love expressed and heard in Jesus' name. In his name. Amen. Let's say thank you. And if I'm going to do a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, something to eat outside if you'd like to help you on your own.